welcome to our panelists. I'll come back to them in, in, in a minute or two. And welcome to everyone who's joined. We have uh, participants joining from uh, all corners of the world, the US, Europe, and Asia, and from the three certainly principal stakeholder groups, uh, investors, um, uh, corporates, and, and startups, of course. This is the first in our series of um, uh, CEO-focused um, panels, uh, discussions, as to how uh, digital health startups are weathering uh, the pandemic, the COVID-19 uh, uh, storm, let's call it that. Uh, it's almost a perfect storm for digital health. Um, we at Sony Gale & Gross are seeing uh, that perfect storm takes shape. Uh, what I mean by that is that um, it, it um, is um, draw, drawing the spotlight, let's say, on digital health. And certainly we're seeing a great deal of dialogue with both entrepreneurs, investors, and, and corporates. Uh, so much so that we have set up a, um, uh, a pandemic crisis team uh, in order to prioritize the requests coming in from uh, the stakeholder groups that I mentioned as they focus on digital health. Uh, and, and therefore uh, enable uh, the engagement between entrepreneurs and, uh, for example, corporates uh, and uh, fast track that, that level of engagement. Uh, we've also shared a point of view on how digital health should be playing a fundamental role in any uh, investor or, or corporate strategy as it relates to engaging with healthcare professionals, engaging with patients, and essentially unblocking the delivery of healthcare across the world. Um, the purpose of these uh, debates is, um, these panels, is really to lead an apolitical debate. And therefore, you will not find us this morning delving into uh, the large range of uh, politicized uh, debate that relates to the pandemic uh, and various geopolitical stances. We're really going to focus on the fact that the pandemic is a, not only a tragedy, uh, but it's also an opportunity. And so we will focus entirely on how these entrepreneurs on our panel in China are fighting the fight for their businesses, their teams, their patients, and their customers. And that's all we're going to focus on this morning. Um, and so I would invite you when you're asking your questions using the Q&A function to focus on those types of questions rather than who did what and who blames who, etc. That's not our purpose this morning. So uh, Q1 2020 uh, is certainly the first quarter of this year, but it's also the first three months, uh, which are a testament to how the pandemic is affecting the ecosystem. Um, for those of you who've had the chance to look at our Q1 2020 um, report, uh, which is an unusual report for us, because normally we only focus on the half year, um, you will discover that certainly funding uh, in digital health across the region is down by half. But we do expect a rebound. Early signs of VC activity in China, for example, shows a strong rebound in March. Uh, particularly around verticals that are seen to be um, benefiting from the confinement and containment measures that have been imposed, uh, ed tech, health tech, et cetera. Um, we certainly are seeing a regulatory shift around the region. Uh, most large countries in the region have either lifted bans or certainly introduced regulations to enable digital health to be adopted and in some cases even to be reimbursed. Uh, so that's encouraging to see much more patient-centric uh, type regulations being brought in. We're even seeing the birth of a new category, uh, the track and trace. Um, we've probably seen all the big news from Apple and Google collaborating around the track and trace um, platform, let's say, which uh, the US government is engaging with and now the UK government is engaging with. But of course, that's nothing new. We've also seen Singapore introduce its own version much earlier than anybody else. And I'm sure in China, it's no different. And we'll discover a little bit more about that later on. Um, so essentially, the spotlight is on digital health, both in a public environment as well as a private environment. And so we are, again, in growth, describing it in the same way that I think a lot of people are now describing it. We are certainly stepping into a new normal. But that new normal will be triggered by not only the current containment issues and the current confinement, which is impacting everyone, but it's also going to have a very prolonged economic impact on most economies going forward. And I'm sure some of you have seen some of the headlines coming out of the IMF, as well as out of the UK, as well as uh, out of various other countries in terms of GDP growth projection. So it's that particular aspect that we want to explore this morning with our panelists. We've carefully chosen our panelists. We wanted to ensure, first of all, they all operate in China. 
We don't want any wannabes who want to talk about how great things are doing in China, but not actually in China. We wanted panelists, entrepreneurs, founders who actually are in China, operating in China and weathering the storm in China. So let me start with um, our, our doyen, our veteran first. Um, and I will do very short introductions. Of course, I will ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves to do justice to them as well as do justice to their own business. First and foremost, uh, let's say it's Stanley Lee. Uh, in the, well, you'll see his name on screen. Uh, founder of DXY, is a veteran of digital health in China. Founded DXY many decades ago. Highly experienced. I would suggest also has weathered through a number of crises, including the 2008 uh, GFC uh, and therefore has substantial experience uh, to share with us. Um, I would describe the XY as probably certainly the largest HTTP network in China and it's probably fair to say the largest in the world, but I'll let you comment on that, Stanley, as you go forward. Uh, second okay, on my list, no, pleasure. Second on my list, uh, in no particular order, so I apologize uh, for the order I've picked. Uh, Jan Velich, um, in short tech, in health, I think is the best way to describe the care voice. Uh, which you, Yan, are a co-founder and you founded in 2014. So again, numerous years of operation in China and success and traction in China. So looking forward to your point of view there. Okay, following that, Charles Bach. So Charles uh, is in, I would describe it, remote healthcare. I'll let you dispute that if you want, Charles, but that's how we would see you. Founder of Hainunu uh, in 2013. Again, a number of years of operating and experience in China. And I would imagine remote healthcare is all the rage at the moment uh, with containment and confinement uh, limiting the delivery of healthcare. You are also a member of the Galen Growth Cohort 2020, uh, which is uh, a, a select number of, uh, of startups that uh, we work with directly uh, in order to um, advantage you uh, within the ecosystem. Finally, but not least, uh, Hailing, Hai Liang, sorry, she. Uh, you are the founder and CEO of uh, Live to Life, uh, data analysis in surgery in the OR. Um, you founded in 2017, so you're a little bit younger than the, uh, the other entrepreneurs here as far as the company age is concerned, but I do know you have extensive entrepreneur experience in China uh, that precedes uh, Live to Life. You are also a member of the cohort 2020. And we look forward to working with you over the course of this year to position you. So those are our panelists. I'm sure you'll agree with me, extensive experience, which will help us uh, certainly build a picture of what's happening on the ground. So let's start with the obvious question and please keep your answers to about two minutes maximum. So we give everybody an opportunity to answer as well as of course, we get a chance to get through many questions. Just a reminder to our participants, you can use the Q&A facility uh, that's available through Zoom and use that to record your question and we will get to your questions, I promise, uh, if we have time set aside for that. So let me start with the first question. Let me start with you, Stanley, if I may. Um, <clears throat> can you give me, a, or us all, a description of who Stanley is, Tian Tian Li, uh, and of course, what is DXY? Sure, thank you very much, Julia, for this opportunity. Uh, DXY was founded in the year of 2000 and my background was neurology. My major words neuromuscular dystrophy and uh, gave up the opportunity of being a doctor and built up the xy 20 years ago my purpose was trying to help my um, colleagues my roommates uh, my friends to um, exchange their ideas um, their clinical experiences and to learn from each other so the xy became uh, the largest physician community in china with over 70% coverage uh, nationwide. We have collected over 2 million physicians in the past 20 years. And the five years ago, we extend our uh, services to the consumer side. And now we have covered over 130 million consumers in China uh, through content, through um, online e-commerce, uh, also through the online consultation. So we are, uh, our mission is to um, use the professional strength and provide it the most trusted products to the public. And our mission is more health and a better life. So that is the XY and I'm the founder, Stanley. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stanley. Uh, let me pass the baton on to Charles. 
Hello, everybody. Thanks a lot for uh, Galen to organize these uh, fantastic webinars and uh, happy to be with my fellow entrepreneurs this afternoon. Um, Charles, so Charles Bark, the uh, founders of Hi Nunu. So, Nunu for the French uh, people means, uh, I mean, for those who are not French, Nunu means nanny in English, or high nanny means a high caring person. We did uh, 12 years R&D in four countries in the world prior to uh, set up our company, who is registered in mainland China, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Now we're opening the branch currently in the COVID period in France. Um, and uh, we aim to help seniors and chronic disease patients not only to live longer, but healthier and happier at home. And in order to do that, we provide a, a comprehensive total solution oriented in preventative uh, care at home that combine genomics, DNA, uh, PAC, that focus only on the 12 serial killers of seniors, including CVD and also diabetics type two. Then we follow up at home with a monitoring with a medical certified connected device. And at the end, we offer telemedicine services uh, with insurances. And we partner, for example, with AXA and also Ping An, uh, biggest insurance in China to offer telemedicine 24 seven at home, as well as protection with uh, accidental and death insurance. So we follow the, 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 the cycle journey, patient journey from risk evaluation, monitoring and protection. Thank you, Charles. We'll come back to some of that definitely. Uh, Jan. Thanks, Julian, and pleasure to be uh, here uh, with the fellow entrepreneurs. My name is Jan Velic. Uh, I'm uh, one of the co-founder and uh, chief business officer at the Care Voice. I've been living in Shanghai in China since 2010, so nearly 10 years. And uh, as you mentioned, the Care Voice started in 2014 and it was a consumer app. And uh, the problem we were trying to solve is the satisfaction of the healthcare uh, in China. And I think the quality and the satisfaction. And what we were looking at uh, is uh, some of the uh, some of the trends that were happening in China at that time, uh, you know, growing growing private hospitals, people uh, dissatisfied with the uh, healthcare quality. So we were actually operating more as like a trip advisor to uh, help them uh, navigate where to go. And ultimately, in 2016, we were able to pivot and uh, develop the B2B to uh, C model and leverage these first findings into the insure tech and uh, insurance offer. So today, uh, you know, CareVoice is a, a fully operational platform. Uh, our key product is a CareVoice OS, and uh, uh, we serve the tech services not only on the health insurance side, but also on the engagement side. Uh, I think, uh, as uh, Charles mentioned, uh, we've been able to work uh, in the past two, three years, uh, working with more than 15 insurance companies across the China. I think. Uh, you know, the AXA, uh, Pinyan, or uh, uh, generally would be one of them. And uh, I think the value what we are trying to bring to, uh, to our insurance uh, uh, clients is, you know, being able to quickly deploy our services, being able to be flexible, and ultimately working with the different insurance player, being able to bring in uh, the most relevant uh, the services and uh, uh, being able to address the dynamics that's happening. And ultimately, our mission at the Care Voice is to make uh, health insurance more human. So uh, today, I've been able to operating in the mainland China and Hong Kong, and uh, in 2020, focusing on expansion in Southeast Asia, where <coughs> Malaysia has been our first target. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. And uh, least but not least, uh, Hai Ling. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, can you hear me uh, clearly? OK. Yep, we can. Uh, my name is uh, Hai Liang Si, uh, co-founder and the CEO of uh, Life to Life. Life to Life is a digital health and telemedicine company focusing on surgical care and uh, critical care. We integrate, document, and analyze surgical data and uh, uh, develop uh, the relevant uh, uh, machine vision and machine learning based uh, AI application. And uh, Life to Life is currently a JLab company. Uh, uh, as we may all know, the JLab is uh, 
the it's like incubator of by uh, uh, Johnson and Johnson Innovation, and myself, uh, my background is mainly on the health informatic and uh, and uh, medical imaging. And uh, before my uh, my own entrepreneurship, my uh, latest latest background is on the surgical system integration and the surgical documentations. Uh, uh, really uh, be happy to be here to discuss with uh, with uh, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we're armed with some intro as we know where everybody fits. Uh, let's go back to the beginning and I'll start with you, Stanley, if I may, although I promise not to always start with you. Um, but let's start with this one, um, this question, which is, where were you when it dawned on you that COVID-19 was not just another seasonal flu epidemic? And more importantly, what was your first reaction, your first response? I was in Hangzhou. Actually, Hangzhou is the headquarter of the XY. And um, at that time, uh, at the end of January, we are going to have vacation. So I still remember January 20th. Actually, that was the last working day before Chinese New Year in the XY. Uh, so at that day, um, we noticed uh, the news released by the government and we realized something bad could happen. But at that time, we had no idea what it is and how bad it would be. So it's just our uh, instinct. The DXY's team has very uh, extensive medical background. Uh, the other uh, two founders and also have clinical medicine, public health background. So. It's just over very instinct response to feel like some uncertain. So the, the, my reaction was not panic, but uh, it's just uncertain. We have no idea what it is. And the information actually were very limited from the very limited resources. But uh, we realized it could be worse. So we built up an emergency team uh, at that day, at January uh, 20th. And we started to deliver our products to the public through our channel. Of course, the first product was the uh, disease tracker, and it is the earliest uh, virus tracker in, in the world. And later on, Johns Hopkins also published their service by using the XY's data, and we became one of the data resource of Johns Hopkins. So my first response was uncertain. We don't know what it is, but uh, it already happened, so we have to deal with it. So that is our response. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll come back to some of that response because of course that's the very market focus for response and we're very interested in seeing what you did internally as well. Uh, Charles, let me switch to you if I may, because of course remote monitoring, uh, elderly care uh, and all those topics must be top of the list for anyone trying to deliver healthcare. So, how did you see this? You know, in other words, same sort of question, but I guess, you know, how did you sort of suddenly realize actually this is going to be something completely different? And, and how did you respond? Yes, uh, definitely. COVID uh, is really a game changer for our business because as we, as you know, us before, we were uh, positioning on uh, telemedicine and all this uh, remote preventative care at home for chronic disease patients and also fragile people such as uh, seniors. But uh, with the uh, confinement of many people, uh, we get a huge demand, not only from government, like our government, French government, but also uh, coming from all over the world. Because the issue is uh, people are focusing, of course, obviously on, 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 tr on helping the COVID patients. And so the healthcare uh, professional uh, in a hospital are completely drawn with those big demands. And there is a bottleneck everywhere in the hospital. But what about the uh, current chronic disease patient and even cancer patient who require still to be uh, helped and also to receive some uh, medical services? So they are kind of left over. And so, uh, the question is, how is it possible to continuously help them to maintain a kind of healthy situation when uh, all the healthcare professionals 
are completely drawn with the COVID. So that is a challenge for, uh, that pose uh, uh, the COVID for all the primary care and all the uh, professionals. And so we had some demand to tackle that and display and, and, and develop more, uh, uh, and to scale our offers and deliver to those needed person and organizations. Cool. Okay, we'll come back to that. So it's a couple of very interesting points that we need to elaborate further on. But uh, let's uh, switch to uh, Hailing. Uh, Hailing, you're obviously a different value proposition, but it would be fascinating to see, um, you know, when did you realize that you were looking at something like tsunami, in fact, uh, and, uh, and how did you respond to it? Oh, uh, uh, at that time, I was on a Chinese New Year vacation in the southern part of China and uh, mm -hmm. Guangdong province. Mm -hmm. And uh, like uh, Stanley mentioned, uh, not, not, not a panic yet. When I first heard of this, and uh, of course, just a, a little bit of scared, uh, that is true. I remember clearly after I heard this, and I went to the local pharmacy to buy, try to buy mask immediately, but I failed. <laughs> I failed. <laughs> All run out of stock, so I'm too late. And uh, later, I I make, made a decision to cancel my vacation to come back, to went back to Shanghai uh, soon together with my family. And later, it uh, proves it is a it's a right decision. Actually, otherwise, if I if I uh, uh, if I uh, went back late, I will be <laughs> there will be more trouble, you know, uh, on the on the way. So, so that's my first uh, experience with this. Okay, thank you. And did that prompt any particular uh, action by you from a business perspective in order to um, play a role in? Um, certainly improving the impact of, uh, of, of, of confinement rules on delivery of healthcare? Uh, of course. And, uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, it will make a, a big uh, impact uh, because uh, uh, at first we uh, just like uh, Stanley mentioned that uh, we don't know what it is right and uh, just a little bit scared mm -hmm. and later later after we get more information and uh, uh, we, we uh, uh, like me I also watch the, the people's behavior and uh, you know the, the, the during that time and uh, you know for example uh, when we go to we are we are trying to avoid to go to the crowd crowded very crowded place and uh, we are we are trying to avoid even to touch the public uh, surface like uh, like a door handle right and like uh, like uh, mm -hmm. elevator buttons mm -hmm. so so this will will make a big big uh, uh, change or impact to our the, to, to the people's daily life and uh, and uh, uh, to us and uh, we we not really uh, to make immediate tangible steps or measures to, 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 uh, for this. We just try to, uh, me personally, just try to re remain calm and think independent and positively. And uh, I, I did have some quick check with, my, the, with the safety and awareness of my core team. And on the other hand, uh, as a digital health and telemedicine company, and I do feel and do see the, 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 the coming big change and uh, as well as the opportunities ahead of us. So that's, uh, that's uh, my, my feeling for this. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for that, Hayling. Uh, Jan, insurance, uh, all the insurance vertical, um, they must be in a world of pain. So very interesting to hear your point of view as to when did you realize this actually was going to be uh, you know, bigger than it was eventually, in fact, being described. And, and, and how did you, did you respond? Sure. Uh, you know, uh, the Care Voice, you guys know, Care Voice is a free co founders. Uh, I'm one of them. Yeah. Sebastian Godin is the CEO, and uh, yeah. Neil Young is the yeah. CPO. At that time, uh, you know, it was the Chinese New Year, it was the holidays. I've been in the Czech Republic, Sebastian had been skiing in Japan, and uh, Neil been in California. <laughs> So uh, you can imagine that the communication between three of us when we heard this, uh, it was definitely 
at the beginning was, okay, what are we going to do? I even remember Sebastian put it in pros and cons list, uh, whether to come back or stay with the family. You know, for me also, I have a 10 months old, old uh, daughter, leaving them back uh, and going to the China where all the governments were saying, uh, hey, we do not suggest you to go back to the China right now. Uh, yeah. But I think ultimately what we've done, we check with our insurance clients. We check with our insurance clients. How do you see it? How do you operate? And ultimately, we have seen that in Hong Kong at that time, the insurances were operating quite normal versus in mainland China. And the decision was to all of us free to fly in in Hong Kong and support our Hong Kong office before the situation comes in China, which happened within the one month later. So uh, indeed, I think uh, this was the, uh, the situation when we have learned. And uh, uh, I think the Hong Kong insurers at that time, uh, they are quite resilient because they went through the, a lot of processes past year uh, during the demonstration and everything. And they are quite used to work remotely and uh, their productivity actually doesn't slow down. So uh, this was a very good opportunity to strengthen our presence in here. While uh, for China, uh, you know, even though there were prediction on the health insurance, uh, the sales will slow down by three months. Uh, we see that, for example, the online distribution, it actually boomed more. It actually, this situation of the COVID, uh, it uh, supported the more uh, sales of the health insurance through the online uh, online channels. And we've seen also within the two, three weeks, uh, working with some of the traditional players, being able to bring in some of the technologies that they can empower uh, this COVID situation, whether that would be the online consultation, whether that would be more like the symptom check-in, uh, whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's uh, uh, significant or not. Or the, even uh, uh, one of the aspects what we have implemented was, uh, you know, the hospital directory. So for, for example, for members we currently have and the plans they have, uh, which hospitals they should go to, uh, where they can have uh, proper checkups and so on. So indeed, I think it was a difficult time in terms of the uh, sales traditionally. I think the agents, you know, in China, the agents, they stayed home, uh, for example, for two months. So we see somewhere some of the health insurances dropping their sales uh, even by 80%. But I think what it is supported, uh, it's indeed, I think, the, the demand for uh, online, uh, online uh, health insurance and the technology, the solution, which can support uh, the, ultimately the members. Okay, great, thank you for that. Uh, let's focus on patients and consumers. I, I use the word broadly here, or the words broadly largely because you guys look at the market slightly different. Uh, but I'd like to focus on these guys because of course, at the end of the day, they're the most impacted by this. Uh, and particularly if they are at high risk. Um, uh, Charles, let's look at that. In terms of, of, of patients uh, or consumers for you, um, they're being, as I said, civilly impacted. How has that manifested itself as you look at your business and as you look at your value proposition to a consumer or to a patient? And how have you therefore reacted to that? First, uh, we we were thinking that uh, the number one uh, shift that we had to, uh, to do is to match the first biggest demand of the market was not first uh, to deliver what we had to deliver normally, which is the wellness kit with connected medical devices. It was just delivering the basic needs for people to be protected like a PPE, personal protecting uh, equipment. So yep. we were thinking that it will be a failure during that time, which is a peak and tsunami for everybody to just uh, focus on, okay, let's focus on delivery, why deliver what we, we deliver normally, which is the uh, complete telemonitoring package. The first biggest need was give me a mask give me a, a gel, hand gel, and mm -hmm. this is the biggest demand by far. So it pushes us to, uh, to deliver uh, anti-COVID kit. Uh, I, may, I may just share my, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, here. I don't know if you see my slides. Yeah, we see a slide. I see a slide anyway. Okay, so normally, just to, to show you the shift where we were doing, that's what I would offer before the COVID. Uh, no. But then, because of the high demand, we developed this first survival kit, which only mm -hmm. combined what the market needed, which is 50 masks, 
and also uh, the uh, gel. Because as we notice myself and all, all over, even in China and France, I was two weeks in France, uh, this is a nightmare to find a mask and also another nightmare to find a gel. And I had mm -hmm. to do like 50, uh, <laughs> over 50 pharmacies retail to find those, uh, those rare uh, uh, masks. And even today in France, it's also a nightmare and it should be prescribed by doctors. So what Hainulu did is immediately try to launch this anti-COVID survival kit where you combine everything in one set. Uh, and we had a huge demand, like up to now, we shipped around more than 1 million masks uh, and uh, we have a weekly a huge order uh, in that, in, in that, that demands. And that was also a very important shift in our business is first, this is a simple rule of the business, try to fit a demand with an offer that is the real hot demand. And then after now, uh, we are shifting in more uh, our business model, which is this survival kit plus all the monitoring. And now we are engaging with, with uh, customers that need both. Uh, and we conclude some agreement here in China with uh, real estate developers who has uh, uh, like a, a Ludi, one of the biggest one. Uh, and they want to develop that in, in uh, uh, their uh, apartment for seniors as a smart home for seniors. Mm -hmm. And uh, also for a big firm MNC like employees. Yep. We have a, a, a big MNCs want to protect their employees to be able to shift from confinement to be a workers and deliver this uh, protection to them. Such a, for example, as Saint-Gobain, it's a big- uh, uh, Glass. Three, um, it's, yeah. it's a big uh, uh, MNC, more than yeah. 300 years history. And they Glass want us to deliver the, the orders, this kind of uh, uh, packaging that you see now for the yeah. employees uh, to be protected. So you're supplying in France as well as in China or just France at this stage? Uh, both. both. And, okay. uh, with with uh, France, we, uh, as you know, we, we belong to, Hainunu belongs to the board of uh, uh, Club Santé, French Healthcare Alliance. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can show just, yeah, this one. Uh, it's a federation of 150 uh, healthcare French company located in France under the, uh, the, the leadership of uh, French embassy, mm -hmm. business friends. And we, we uh, try to uh, help the French institution and the French company who are struggling, completely struggling with the COVID. And so on the ba ba voluntary basics, every day, one hour, we meet together uh, every day at 6.30 to, uh, to help the French company based on our uh, anti-COVID task force mm -hmm. and deliver what is required in France to be, uh, to be saved in this war, anti-COVID war. Fantastic, it's a great turnaround. Let me switch to Stanley, if I may. Stanley, looking at it through the eyes of the HCP, the healthcare professional, um, and their perception, I guess, of how this is impacting patients. How did you as a business react to help the HCP and therefore DXY be able to improve delivery of care in that particular context? Okay, actually, uh, we helped both HCP and the consumers. Mm. On the consumer side, uh, we collaborated with doctors and nurses. So we create contents and try to deliver correct science-based information to educate the public, to let the public know much better about this disease, about transmission, about uh, mortality sort of things. So this is the first thing we were doing. Uh, our purpose was trying to educate the public with the science-based evidence-based knowledge and relieve their concerns. So the second part will go back to the HCP part. The DXY is the largest physician community in China. Um, and the many DXY doctors, they have great needs to understand what this disease is and how the doc other doctors treat this disease. Um, so we have our channels and we can contact the doctors and the nurses on the front line in Wuhan 
and we invited m many doctors to uh, take videos to uh, make some presentations uh, in their spare time. Uh, they were pretty busy, but still um, they take their uh, spare time to shoot some videos and presentations and, and send it back to DXY and they try to tell other doctors uh, their understanding, their experiences, and their lessons. So we made around 36 online curriculums uh, with, uh, from the diagnosis to treatment and to some specific group of people like pregnant women, senior people, uh, children. And we put all these stuff online and over uh, 70,000 doctors and nurses go online to learn for free. And um, after China um, goes to the stable situation, we ask the many volunteers to translate all the curriculums and put the English subtitle on this. So last week, we put over educational materials on the WebMD Medscape. Medscape is the largest online professional platform for physicians globally. So we are working with Medscape and trying to help other countries' doctors. And from my observation, actually, the doctors in the United States, in UK, they have a lot of resources to learn the knowledge. But for the doctors in uh, Iran or uh, some other uh, developing countries, they have very limited access to the educational materials. So one example I can share with you is we are working with uh, social media in um, Iran uh, with over 70,000 doctors and nurses in Iran. So they learned the curriculums we created and also they proposed a lot of questions in Persian. And then volunteers translate the question from Persian to English and then to Chinese. And we organize the doctor in China to answer the questions in Chinese, then to English and then to Persian. And we are helping them to understand um, and to learn some experiences or lessons we have collected in China. So that is my answer. Thanks, Stanley, thank you very much. Let me switch gears slightly, just in the interest of time, and we are starting to get some questions through, and I would encourage the audience to continue asking some more so that we can switch to those at some stage. Uh, Jan, let me switch to you um, and look at it more operationally, if I may, rather than looking at the patient at this stage. Um, what actions have you, are you guys taking to ensure that um, operationally you guys can weather this storm, both short term as well as long term? Because the economic impact is going to be a long term one. Um, and of course, you know, any particular forecast you may have built at the end of 19 is probably no longer valid for, to weather through 2020. So can you give us a flavor of some of the mitigating strategies that you've thought out as three co-founders as to how you are going to uh, get through 2020 as, as yes. a business? <clears throat> yes. Uh, again, I think uh, to get to your answer, uh, I think I want to just quickly sum up that uh, I do believe, and then uh, among the co-founders, we believe that uh, China is indeed the leading, uh, you know, the health insurance uh, digital transformation currently. Mm -hmm. I think we saw the first wave in 2016, 2017, where the insurers are starting to engage in more with the clients through the mobile apps and the claims. That was a hit at that time. But uh, very quickly, it went to the, you know, the second wave of 2018 to 2020, where you know, the insurers starting to, uh, uh, to digitalize the customer journey, customer healthcare journey. You, you will see some of the services around the wellness, around the, you know, the straps, uh, rewards, uh, mental health, uh, medical doctor, director, online appointment, and so on. But what we see now, especially with, uh, you know, this uh, pandemic situation coming in, I think there's a third wave. And uh, from, indeed, starting in 2020, the interns are looking at how they can provide the integrated and unified personalized journey and personalized journey to uh, specific segments, specific population, uh, and uh, how you can attract them. So indeed, when coming back to your question, Julian, you know, what, do you, what we have done under the pandemic, actually we see that, uh, you know, the Q1 for us, uh, for a care voice was one of the strongest quarter. And strongest quarter is because, uh, you know, we already before uh, our platform was enabling the insurance to be able to tailor to specific plans for a specific population. And now coming, coming to this era, uh, 
I think this is more and more need that uh, the, the people perceive in the healthcare uh, more and more and uh, being able to tailor some of those plans for them, whether it's for a woman, whether it's for a sports people, whether it's for a children. I think we get into demand on this. And I also saw the question, for example, from the Matthew who asked uh, uh, as a, one, of the, one of the audience person, how do we foresee the Q2 and Q3? And we do foresee that uh, you know, in China and in Hong Kong, uh, this is a strong part uh, currently generating the growth. And the pandemic actually uh, introduced another aspect, which is the kind of, we call it smart channel which is actually the channels, the digital channels, they were before selling uh, consumer goods, now engage in more, how we can provide more healthcare and how we can provide a more health insurance for people. But then from the operational side, Julian, uh, I think indeed uh, from the investors and from, uh, from the, you know, the leadership team, uh, people need to be cautious. I think we need to be <laughs> cautious uh, you know, on spending. I think, uh, uh, can you, can you uh, uh, project that you will make that much revenue versus that one revenue? Uh, I think we are quite close to know where we can be, but uh, you know, looking at on a, what's happening in the world and how the, all the financial crisis is coming into the place, we need to be prepared. And I think this is what uh, comes down to that. Uh, one of our uh, shareholders yesterday had a, a webinar. And he was saying, uh, "You need to be like a cockroach. You need to be like a cockroach. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to, uh, you know, uh, absorb all, everything what's coming up, and to expect the worst." And I think uh, this being in mind, even though we had a strong, uh, strong quarter, I think this is uh, one of the aspects which we are looking at and uh, looking at how we can uh, prolong our runway or how we can prolong our uh, direction, uh, expecting that this financial crisis could be not only 2020, but even uh, leapfrog to the 2021. Mm -hmm. And you guys had a raise last year, didn't you? I seem to recall, a reasonably yes. large raise. Um, so what have your investors been saying to you since the raise, particularly in view of the fact that, uh, you know, uncertainty does exist in the system? What sort of dialogue have you had with them? Uh, I think uh, I could uh, answer you better in a one week time because we have our board uh, <laughs> next Wednesday. <laughs> so I will learn more uh, uh, on a specific, uh, specific uh, direction. But I think we, we had uh, already uh, quite, uh, quite extensive round with some of the, some of the investors and uh, who's sitting also on our board and, you know, being able to show us uh, indeed, I think uh, the projection on how the pandemic uh, will be still growing and impacting, especially the developing world in here in Asia is still projecting, uh, you know, peaking sometimes in a June and the last thing the whole year. So just be prepared. I think one of the aspects is uh, focusing on our existing customers. I think, uh, you know, to generate the new business, of course, this is, uh, this is uh, one of the area which we still will be exploring, but your customer is your client, is uh, you know your partner, and being able to grow in the business with them in this situation is very important. Uh, and uh, indeed, again, going down to the cost, and I think uh, you know looking at on all of the unnecessary expenses we're making today, uh, mm -hmm. all of the kind of uh, you know nice to have, which uh, before <laughs> it was it was good, but now with the projection coming in, I think this is this is the key message and. Uh, our uh, VP of uh, Finance, Luke, has uh, been working past three weeks uh, very heavily to looking at on all of the all of the spendings we make and all of the kind of balance sheet PNL uh, and uh, how to optimize it. How to optimize it so you don't sacrifice the growth of the company, but uh, being as uh, lean as uh, possible. So I hope cool. uh, this that makes perfect sense. All that, Jan. Let me switch to Heiling. Um, your offering is much more in, I would suggest, uh, the, the, I guess, the hospital sector. I, I, pardon me if I, I get something slightly wrong in terms of description. But I imagine the confinement, the fear, the, um, the sometimes misinformation means that a lot of uh, operating schedules have been disrupted substantially in order to cope with the burden of, of COVID-19. Um, how does that affect you uh, as a business and, and are you able to adapt or are you just able or you needing to change the way in which you look at 2020? Uh, uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, mm -hmm. we, are, we, are, we are basically uh, a telemedicine and digital health company. Mm -hmm. So we see the actually is uh, more of an opportunity for us. And, uh, okay, great. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, of course we we also encounter a lot of troubles, like uh, a lot of events cancelled and uh, hospital visa are postponed. And uh, but uh, we we do see this uh, as a very very big change and uh, and uh, the new uh, new normal to adopt the digital uh, digital solution, digital tools. Mm -hmm. 
as we see that uh, uh, in the in the in the future, the more patient uh, or more consumer they will uh, try the virtual virtual care virtual care, and the uh, and the more and there will be more uh, 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 healthcare professionals, uh, doctors, nurses, uh, they will use the digital tools to you know to empower their uh, their daily work. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, as far as uh, we uh, we are concerned, and uh, life to life is concerned, and uh, and uh, uh, for example, we 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 actually have long uh, experience and the long uh, 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 experience and expertise in the you know the remote uh, acute care and the critical care uh, delivery and the surgical surgical care delivery, and. Uh, and uh, for for example, uh, about ten years ago, although uh, Life to Life is a relatively young uh, company, uh, startup company, but we do have some legacies and uh, experience. And I and my co-founding partner, and we we have been in the digital uh, operation room integration and the surgical mm -hmm. data uh, documentation uh, domain for for more than uh, more than uh, fifteen years, and. Uh, and uh, uh, I still remember clearly. And uh, about ten years ago, uh, one of my partners, and uh, uh, who is a uh, Philips uh, monitor distributor in southern, southern China, he asked me for help. And uh, because there's a uh, unmet need or demand from some hospital, uh, please uh, provide uh, some kind of uh, tele ICU solution uh -huh, or yep. eICU solution, because uh, the, the 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 head of ICU they want he want to. Uh, uh, monitor uh, remotely many many ICU beds, and uh, uh, at the same time, and uh, by himself because he's the expert. He's the very few expert in in that big hospitals. So at that time, still you know the the, the whole world is still using the analog videos and uh, and uh, and the very low bandwidth of network, and. Uh, and, uh, and and today, you know, during the pandemic, the, the whole system, the existing system, are overwhelmed by the by the by the flood of ill the patient, uh, the infected patient, and the lack of the uh, facilities and equipment like uh, like the ICU and uh, uh, ICU beds, ventilators. So uh, as far as our uh, life to life is concerned, uh, we are. Uh, what we can offer is uh, using our expertise to to empower the, the the or enable the existing healthcare facilities and the limited limited healthcare professional to to take care of more patients and in the meantime to protect them protect them from the infection the infectious disease because uh, by by the digital way by the remote uh, remote and the virtual uh, solutions and uh, and uh, and the the, the the most precious healthcare workers can be protected, right? And uh, so we think our work and our uh, our technology is uh, is very meaningful uh, during this particular time. So uh, we just want to uh, because we are relatively small and we played we are now playing at a relatively small scale. So we want to. Uh, to, well, we, we, we are looking for partners to help us to scale it up, uh, to, to contribute and to, to uh, beat the let's, pand let's, uh, pandemic um, together. Yeah. Let's focus on partners and partnerships. We certainly at Galen Growth have uh, for a number of years now been working closely with startups and, and engaging and connecting with corporates as well as investors. And certainly we've seen a, a big pickup in the last few weeks, months, um, from corporations seeking solutions to address their, their immediate pain point, of course, which is their revenues have been impacted by the containment uh, regulations have been brought in. Uh, Stanley, let, let me talk to you quickly first. I know uh, from first hand, having had that conversation with you recently, um, what has been that appetite from corporates? Uh, what are they looking for as, your, as DXY and how are you addressing it? That's a good question. Uh, pharmaceutical companies in China, they used to use uh, pharmaceutical reps, medical reps, and uh, MSLs to deliver their key messages to the doctor. Uh, and the traditional way is offline. And the big pharma, they know uh, offline events is low efficiency, but still uh, this is a tradition. And uh, 
many pharmaceutical companies, including uh, MNCs, they are still using the offline events as the mainstream way to deliver their key message to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And when the outbreak happens, um, most of the medical reps and MSL were quarantined and they cannot go to the hospitals. And some hospitals were even shut down. So they have no channel to engage, to, to talk with the, the doctor. So they come back to, to us and seek for a solution to deliver their key message to the, to the doctors. Uh, digi digital way used to be a, a alternative way uh, from pharmaceuticals perspective, but with the outbreak, I believe digital channel, online channel has become a must have a channel to pharmaceutical companies. And I can share you a data, uh, DXY provide online education curriculums. And in, in the past one month, the demands from the corporate has been raising 900% compared with the uh, same time last year. So I do believe um, online channel and online digital channel has become a um, mandatory channel, mandatory way for pharmaceutical companies to think seriously about their marketing strategy, even after the outbreak has disappeared uh, at the end of this year. So I strongly believe the pandemic brought us a very different new normal uh, compared with its traditional ways. And the pharmaceutical companies, they need to rethink about their strategy in terms of marketing access and doctor education. Thanks, Stanley. Um, looking at time, I just want to make sure some of the uh, audience questions are asked. Um, to any of you, I guess, this question is uh, related to investors. Um, in view of the current uncertainties, do you see investors backing out uh, and save more liquidity, liquidity for the prolonged uncertainty period? Any of you have had that conversation with investors or been to any discussions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Perfect. from my perspective, from my perspective, I didn't see such kind of thing happening around me. Um, you know, the inter, uh, internet hospitals or uh, digital health is still on its very early stage. So investors, I understand investors may have a huge concerns and uncertainties, but uh, many investors in this field, they are uh, long-termist means they have long-term perspective. They don't expect a short-term return. So I think most of the investors, they have patience and confidence, and they do believe even after the outbreak, there could be bring more opportunities because from our observation, the people's amenities to healthy life, to wellness is very profound. And even after the outbreak, uh, it will not disappear. So. Uh, I think investors with long-term perspective will still hang on here and uh, keep investing their, their, their money into this field. So that yeah, is I my think perspective. That's, it, it, that echoes a lot of what I've heard uh, from other investors. In fact, one summed it up very well for me, which is if it's a sound business model that has relevance, uh, it is highly unlikely that it will lose, in, uh, investors will lose interest and certainly highly unlikely that its valuation has been very impacted. Uh, and so I guess that just follows the uh, the, 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 the what's the word the the pro proverb I guess to some extent that uh, in times of crisis capital has a habit of flying towards quality and I think digital health are clearly in that bucket. Um, Charles, very quickly, please, if you had a, a response. Yeah, we had the reverse situation, uh, which is uh, uh, business people in France considering the uh, extreme situation in France came to us and said, we want to open a, a branch of Hainunu in France and invest in that. And uh, we were not prepared uh, uh, to open a branch. It was more on the middle term, but now we are really on the middle of uh, uh, opening a branch pushed by those uh, investors because they feel that uh, our value proposition completely matching what's going on. And as uh, mm -hmm. Stanley said, it will not disappear with the COVID. Telemedicine, online, mm -hmm. digital services will be booming after and will be a steady, uh, steady services. It's not just a fashionable services, it will be a booster. 
Absolutely. I think you're echoing what uh, everyone on the panel has said uh, uh, in their own way so far. Um, Jan, a lot of questions are coming up. I'm sure you can see them around insurance. Let me just ask one of them as I know we're running out of time here. Uh, it's the one that says, um, looking ahead, do you anticipate a growth in business through clients for you as, as, as you are primarily focused on insurers? Uh, or are they just simply too busy uh, fire, uh, firefighting internally? Yeah, I appreciate this question. I think uh, the answer is yes, I do anticipate a new business. And why? Uh, I just give you the example. You know, even the insurers who are not today very strong in the health insurance, uh, say they do in the saving products or they do in the critical illness products, they are coming to us or they, uh, you know, looking for possibilities how they can uh, launch the health insurance. Because, you know, health insurance right now is hot and it's hot in a way because uh, people are uh, during the pandemic much more aware that, uh, you know, they need to be protected, they need to be aware. Uh, so, you know, just one example of what we are exploring today is to work in with the traditional insurer uh, who doesn't have uh, the necessary capabilities to be able to underwrite the health insurance product or to serve uh, the health insurance product from the claim or medical network. Coming to us uh, that with, the with, uh, with our platform, we are able to bring in these pieces together and provide them this solution. So from this side, I do see uh, the coming the new business. And on the other hand, I will uh, echo what Stanley mentioned is you know, the boom of the online distribution, uh, this is what we foresee right now in China, has been developing during the pandemic in a February. This is something where, you know, the channels that serving the consumer goods with the millions of the people come in and asking for how can we attract the people to, you know, uh, and offer them more health, re health related uh, services. So I think this mixer mix of uh, not only the insurance uh, selling online, but, uh, you know, this mixer of uh, health insurance protection you know, technology around it that it's, uh, you know, customized or personalized to that specific population and then popping into these distribution channels. It's a model which, uh, as Charles uh, mentioned for him, uh, for us also emerged uh, during this pandemic. And this is why I foresee that the new business, uh, especially in Q2 and Q3 coming in right now, uh, will be quite strong. And uh, on top of this, I think uh, we're looking at on a new business, uh, not only in China and uh, Hong Kong, but uh, I think one of our one of our uh, key objective in 2020 and uh, one of the objective which I'm leading currently is to be able, you know, the experience would be done right now uh, under the COVID in China, uh, being able to explore the other market. And as I mentioned, uh, we are quite far right now with uh, one of our partner in Malaysia, being able to specifically target in this uh, in this kind of the model where you bring in the personalized health insurance uh, with the large. A distribution channel and serving to the population that actually need uh, what you're offering them. Thank you very much, Jan. I'm afraid, panelists, there are many questions I'd like to ask, and I'm sure there's many more um, nuggets of, of, of information you'd like to share, but we have run out of time. So let me thank you all profusely for your time, your advice, your insights, which have been incredibly useful. Um, it's certainly listening to you very clear that uh, investors don't seem to be wobbling. Uh, that your business models uh, are benefiting and that the spotlight is clearly on digital health now and going forwards. Um, and it really conjures up for listening to you and how you guys have responded conjures up for me the well-known Darwin quote, which is, it is not the most intellectual or the strongest of species that survives, but the species that survives is the one that is able to adapt to and adjust best to the changing environment in which it finds itself. I think the four of you have clearly demonstrating that how you are adapting, and therefore how you're winning, uh, despite the headwinds. So thank you again for your time. Uh, just a quick note to let you know that we will be doing a similar webinar focused on Indonesia on the 22nd of April. Uh, visit our website to subscribe. Again, thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you for all your questions and thank you very much panelists uh, for your insights and your time. Have a great day. Thank you, Julian. It was a thank pleasure. You. Thank you, thank Julian. You. Bye -bye. Have a good day. Thank Bye. you, gentlemen. Bye. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay safe, indeed. Yes, you're absolutely right.